You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the last of the Star Trek The Next Generation movies, Nemesis. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hey, Father Corey. How's it going? Folks, be sure to stick around to the end of the show. We have a lot of great feedback from our recent 300th episode where we talked about the best Star Trek episodes ever. And uh, so stick around to the end for that. I want to encourage you to check out our merchandise store to see where you can get your very own Secrets of Star Trek t-shirt. And you can find that at sqpn.com slash merch. And another show on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy is The Secrets of Technology which you can find wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash technology. So uh, we are discussing the 2002 movie, Star Trek Nemesis. Uh, And Jimmy, can you give us a recap of what happens in this one? This week, the Romulan Senate refuses to make an alliance with someone called Shinzon of Remus, and a traitor leaves a device in the Senate that kills everyone and causes their faces to melt like Nazis in front of the Ark of the Covenant. We then cut to a pre-wedding wedding reception for Riker and Troy, where Data sings Irving Berlin's Blue Skies. The Enterprise then goes to Beta Z for the ceremony, but before they get there, they detect a set of positronic signals coming from a pre-warp planet. From the planet, they collect the parts of an android that Dr. Sung built before he built Data. Its name is B4, and it's very simple and childlike mentally. Data has his memories downloaded into it, but these don't seem to do B4 any good. Admiral Janeway then calls Picard and tells him to divert to Romulus, where there is a request from the new Romulan Praetor, Shinzon of Remus, who wants a diplomatic mission from the Federation. And it turns out that Shinzon is a genetic clone of Picard, so he's Picard's evil twin son clone thing. And he's a really evil evil twin son clone thing. He telepathically rapes Counselor Troy on her honeymoon, And he's got a super weapon spaceship that has planet killing capabilities. So he's basically built a Death Star, a first in the history of Star Trek. Almost. And he wants to use it on Earth. As Picard's evil twin son clone thing, Shinzon also has daddy issues. And he has a genetic defect that will require a transfusion from Picard to fix. And then after that, he wants to kill Picard to give his own life meaning. All this leads up to one of the biggest, most dramatic space fights in Star Trek history. It goes on for 30 minutes, and it's intense. Lots of things go boom, lots of things go crunch, and the writers basically made a list of everything that could go wrong in a Star Trek space battle and then used it. And it all takes place in the Mutara Nebula, or the uh, Bassin Rift Nebula. Eventually, Shinzon gives, uh, gives up on getting his transfusion from Picard, and he orders his crew to kill everyone on the Enterprise with the Genesis device, uh, the Death Star, uh, the super weapon, and then head to Earth. <laughs> but Picard suicidally beams over to Shinzon's ship, takes on his crew single-handed, and then impales Shinzon to death. Data, who has been left in command of the Enterprise, violates his orders and follows Picard. He uses a prototype personal transporter to beam Picard back to the Enterprise. Data then sacrifices himself by firing a phaser into the superweapon thingy, causing Shenzon's ship to explode. Afterwards, the crew grieves the loss of Data, but while they're in space dock, B4 starts to assimilate the memories from Data's Katra, setting us up for the very next movie, Star Trek XI, The Search for Data, which we never got. The end. (laughs) All right. Uh, I have more to say on the those parallels. Yeah. Uh, Father Corey, your initial impressions of this movie? Well, well, we did get the search for data. It was called Star Trek Picard or Picard Season Three. Oh. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. that's where we ended up getting. It. You know, I actually liked this better, but only mm-hmm. when I tuned out the comedy. Mm-hmm. I, for me, the biggest problem with this one is they tried too hard with the comedy, and part of it it was partially written by Brett Spiner. Mm -hmm. So I think he tried a little too hard to bring comedic elements into it. I mean, he's, he's a comedian and he's a good comedian. It's just, Mm -hmm. it didn't work in this. It didn't work. You know, when you just look at the plot, you know, yeah, there's a parallels, but that's why they're called tropes. There's going to be tropes and everything. 
it was better when you just kind of tune out the whole humor and trying to be funny and you know the of course data going on you know why because why data not now you know <laughs> yeah right once you tune that kind of stuff i i enjoyed it better when i just kind of okay ignore the comedy and let's move on how about you jimmy your impression of this one uh, I didn't have a problem with the comedy, but um, I, you know, I, having B four act like a child and constantly asking why and stuff, I was okay with that. Um, I think so. This one I have a kind of a complex relationship with. I, I am a firm believer in the odd, bad, even, good rule, um, and this was the tenth film in the, which has to be understood with some nuance. It's not that all the odds are bad, all the evens are good. It's that every time you get an even movie, it's better than the one that preceded it. And that holds here. This is the 10th movie. It was better than Star Trek IX, The Search for Hippies. <laughs> um, and so it was better, but it's also profoundly flawed. I saw someone a number of years ago point out how uh, at a certain point in the Star Trek film series, the producers kind of kept trying to remake Wrath of Khan, where mm-hmm. you need this single, you know, supervillain for our heroes to fight. And mm-hmm. that worked with Wrath of Khan in part because Khan was not an out of the blue supervillain. We knew who he was yep. and we knew what his motivations were and why he resented Captain Kirk. And so it all made sense. But the the later supervillain ones they've done have all consistently been pretty lame. And it's clear you don't need a supervillain for a Star Trek movie to work. Search for Whales did not have a villain at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it was great. Yeah. Um, Star Trek VI, where the wall comes down in space. That was great. And there's not a single villain. It's a conspiracy of different people from different sides. And so you don't need a single supervillain as the focusing antagonist to make a great Star Trek movie. But that's what they try to do here. This is essentially a remake of Wrath of Khan with Shinzon instead of Khan. Well, Shinzon is nowhere near as, as, as good a villain as Khan. In, it, in part, it's because of the fact he comes out of nowhere. You know, they have to... They have to build and introduce this character and his motivations, and they're lame. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's got these daddy issues. He wants to kill Picard so his own life can have meaning. And he, he, he you know, if you watch his Viceroy, played by Ron Perlman, he's constantly telling him, dude, you need to do other things than what you're doing. Dial it mm-hmm. back. <laughs> yeah, because his, his, and his Viceroy is right. You know, um, they've actually got a blood sample from Picard that they, they don't explain it clearly, but they, it apparently will help them to some extent, even though it's not a full transfusion. It'll help them to some extent with the ticking clock on Shinzon. He's got hours left. And the Viceroy keeps saying, we don't have time for these telepathic rapes, dude. We need to do the procedure now. <laughs> and so he, he, the Viceroy is right. Shinzon is an idiot. Mm. As a ruler, he's a bad supervillain. He's bad at his job, and that's why he dies. So there's a lot in here I don't like. There are a lot of plot holes, like the Remans are slaves from the Dilithium mine on Remus, and they built a a super weapon spaceship that dwarfs the Romulan military force and the Federation in secret how? Yeah. You know, I mean, there's just (laughs) tons of plot holes here. What I do like about this, I I like the comedy um, and I like the giant space battle. This is the best space battle in the history of Star Trek. Normally what they Mm -hmm. try to do, and this is, I think, a flaw in Deep Space Nine, is they try to make impressive space battles by shoving as much stuff on the screen as possible. You know, Mm -hmm. where you've got this fleet of a bazillion ships. And, and that kind of worked in Deep Space Nine's case, but more recently, like when in Strange New Worlds, when young Kirk shows up with an army of drone ships and it's just a massive number of ships. Okay, that's not impressive. Yeah. That's, that's just copy and pasting ships on the screen. What, what here we have is a battle between basically two ships that goes on for 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. And and it's impressive, and they do stuff we've never seen on Star Trek before, like ramming 
one ship mm-hmm. into another and then pulling that ship away and you see the massive destruction on both ships and when the when when Picard goes to use the self destruct device it's offline for the first <laughs> time in Star Trek history he can't yeah. self destruct yep you know and there there so i think you know there is a principle i was uh, john la carre the spy fiction writer said that this was one of the lessons he learned and i took it to heart as a writer if there's a conflict between two characters at the climax of your novel, it needs to go on for as long as possible. And La Carre said this was something he didn't know at the beginning of his career. And if you read his early novels, he, he builds up to his final conflict between his hero spy and the evil spy. Mm-hmm. And it's just a little bit of fisticuffs and it's over in a page. Right. And, and what you need, no, you've built up these characters. You need to have a lengthy discharge of the hostilities between them in order to be satisfying. And that they do here. We mm-hmm. get a lengthy, brutal space battle that is, dwarfs anything else in Star Trek history. And that, and some of the comedy, is what I like about this movie. Everything mm-hmm. else is like, eh. So for me, um, I love the space battle. You're right. I mean, that is, it is one of the mm-hmm. best. Uh, it, 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 is, it is really great. Um, I love that little scorpion fighter. Like, that's, mm-hmm. I, I love the – Yeah. I, I wish Star Trek had more little fighters in it, uh, but that's a whole other thing. That's a shit well, thing. I've so. complained about the, the, the fighters or the lack thereof. But. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing that comes to mind is, is, that, is realizing how Picard-centric – all of the TNG movies, TNG movies became, mm-hmm. uh, or, even maybe, or not even became, they were from the beginning. TNG, while Picard was the captain, it was an ensemble story, but, but it became all about Picard to the point where the TNG revival was called Picard. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And they finally figured out by the last season, you know, we sort of bring in the rest of the cast because the people would really like that. And hey, we got the best season of Picard. And I feel like that's the detriment and that it reaches peak in some ways in this movie where it's just, it's all about Picard that I don't really feel like any of the other characters get their due. I mean, they, they get a little bit of, you know, get a bone thrown to them here and there, but nothing great. Um, a few things about this movie. This was, as I mentioned, the final TNG movie. It had been four years since insurrection, which is hmm. pretty remarkable. That's the longest gap. Uh, since they had started doing movies. And apparently, um, Patrick Stewart was paid almost as much for this one movie as he was for all seven seasons of the TV wow. show. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, it did so poorly at the box office that it nearly killed cinematic Star Trek and nearly killed Star Trek, period. And I mean, after Enterprise ended a few years after this, that was it for a while until the the J.J. Abrams Kelvin reboot and then the whole uh, Paramount Plus thing with Star Trek Stop. Discovery. Yeah. <laughs> when things returned. But it nearly killed Star Trek. This is the worst performance. I think they said the worst performance of a Star Trek movie. It got beat by the J-Lo movie Made in Manhattan and its premiere. So, I mean, that's, <clears throat> or it's the second week. That's, that's pretty bad. <laughs> it's, it's also the second worst ranked of all the Star Trek films following only um, Star Trek V, The Search for God. Yeah. Um, but I actually think it's better than some of the others. Like I mentioned, it's better than Star Trek Search for Hippies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One thing, they, um, and fans weren't alone in hating this, both uh, LeVar Burton and Marina Sirtis are mm-hmm. on record as hating this movie. Like, they, did, hate, they hated it. And Marina Sirtis could not stand the director, Stuart Baird, mm-hmm. um, who famously never watched an episode of TNG before making this movie. Yeah, and also thought, apparently, I've read that he thought uh, Jordy was an alien, and he kept referring to LeVar Burton as Laverne. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> I can see why, why LeVar Burton didn't like him. Um, and and I, I can understand maybe why Marina Sirtis, it was an element of why she didn't like, like him or the movie, was those weird rapey scenes, the mental yeah. te- telepathic rape, which were gratuitous. I didn't, like, like as you mentioned, they serve no purpose there was no point except to show maybe that shinzon's bad but well kind of know that yeah and and it showed that the viceroy had telepathic capabilities which comes back to be the conclusion that's that's the that's i think the real reason the rape scene is in there um Uh. because the i think what they did is they tried to make a list of what every when you're writing and you're writing conflict one of the things you may do and i've done this is make a list of everything you can think of that could happen in the conflict 
you know, all the reversals and how they'd be dealt with and so forth. And so what they do later in the conflict is they've got this perfect cloak on on Shinzon's ship that cannot mm-hmm. be penetrated through normal means. And so they try to figure out how many different ways could we manage to get a shot at this ship. Like mm-hmm. when it fires, it you can see where the where the fi- where the where it where the blast came from, shoot there immediately. Mm-hmm. Or if one of these, there's a, a little short sequence where they got a couple of Romulan allies and Picard says, okay, if, if they impact with their firing, anytime you see an impact, aim at the impact point. And then they wanted to do, oh, well, let's give Marina Sirtis something to do so she can telepathically tell us where to find the ship. And so, um, so rather than have, and they have this scene, which is actually I'm impressed by where she is up with Worf at the firing control system and and he's she's like guiding his hand or he's guiding her hand but she's making empathic contact with the viceroy and locating him in space and she's actually not looking down at her hand at all mm-hmm. but she's targeting with her hand and this actually fits some theories in parapsychology where you know you're not consciously in control of 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 how your psychic perceptions are being used, but your it it your subconscious is controlling your hand in order to bend a dowsing rod when it needs to be bent or something like that. And that's essentially she's dowsing in space mm. right, for where do we aim? That's good. And so they wanted to now she could have just done that with I sense a ship with dozens of crew members on it. Let's fire at that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that would have worked. But they wanted to personalize it, and so they they want her finding the Viceroy in particular, because he was the conduit through which Shenzhen raped her. And this becomes this empowerment theme, and she says, remember me? And then, blam, they get a shot in on the alien ship. So I think that's the real reason for the rapey scene earlier, is they wanted to get her in telepathic contact with the Viceroy so she could do a reverse DNS lookup on him and blast him. (laughs) And, um, and, And But otherwise, it's irrelevant to the plot, and they could have written the same firing solution without the rape. Yeah. I, I, it makes me uncomfortable that they included it. I just didn't like. Yeah, it's awful. That. Yeah, it, yeah, it's yeah. So and um, it, 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 it it again makes Shinzon look like an idiot. Yes. Well, that's yeah. That's a from a dramatic point of view. It also does. By the way, speaking of Shinzon, uh, Tom Hardy uh, playing mm-hmm. Shinzon uh, it does a good role. You know, does a good job with the, what he's got to work with. Um. So uh, yeah, I like but him. he's, he's like, no he's no Ricardo Montalban. No, no he's not, he doesn't chew the set as well as Ricardo Montalban does. Uh, Ron Perlman always, you know, good in under, especially under makeup. So that's just those yep. two. Uh, so we have this theme of sort of as mirrors or, uh, but also this theme of, are we the sum of our experiences or our genetics or something else? And that keeps coming up, you know, this idea of, you know, Picard, if, if you had grown up like I had in the circumstances, mm-hmm. you would be me and vice versa. And Picard has to kind of wrestle with that a little yeah. bit. Maybe he would have. It, it's interesting because we've got, so the classic analysis is in nature versus nurture. Nature mm-hmm. is your genetics and, and nurture is the environment you're raised in. And so we, they're clones. So even though it's not a perfect clone, but they're clones. So they've got the same nature. and. Shinzon's argument is all that's different between us is the nurture. If you had lived my life, I w- you would be me. If I had lived your life, I would be you. And Picard introduces a third element, which you normally don't get, choice. Mm. It's not just that their life histories are different. They've made different choices. And free will is then introduced as an explanation for the differences between them, in addition to the nature-nurture argument, which has is, is been made historically. And I think that is uh, tremendous. Right. I think that's a great idea uh, to explore dramatically. It's not just nature. It's not just nurture. There is also free will. Mm. And, I and mean, there's, but, go ahead. There's ideas uh, floats out there, too, that we're basically programmed, that our DNA has basically programmed us into how we will behave. And that's a lot of what Shinzon is saying is, you know, you've got this programming that if you were in this situation too with the nurture, you know, that, that is the nature nurture argument, but mm-hmm. it, it really did seem to kind of flirt with that idea too of, 
well, you've got this programming. You just didn't have to activate it. Essentially. Yeah, like we're meat bots with uh yeah, with a with with a destiny that we can't change. And, exactly. and you know, that whole choice thing, I mean, it comes back to that TNG episode, I don't remember the title, where Picard data um the all powerful being Q takes Picard back to his past when he was young. Tapestry. Ta- oh, thank you. Uh young, brash, a jerk, <laughs> mm-hmm. and he gets, you know, uh, impaled by a Nosikin over a Domjot, and mm-hmm. uh and that makes him reassess his life and he makes different choices from that point on. And I think that's part of it is it's not just the environment that he was in where he was in Starfleet, but he, he had experiences that caused him to make different choices. And he could have in that moment, having experienced that at the hands of the Nausicaan chose differently, but it's his choice. And so it's, it's his morals, his morality that really is part of that free will and choice. So I, yeah, I agree. I, I think it's great that they bring that up here and I wish they kind of made it a little bit more explicit um, in, in this, uh, if it was better written maybe, um, but I, I'm glad it was part of it. So a, a key element to this is this whole Romulan situation. And we are led to believe that there's these two planets in this system. This is, this kind of goes back into a lot of the secondary media that, that cover this oh, Romulus it, it, and it, Remus. It, yeah. It actually goes. So for people who may not be aware, Romulus and Remus were twin brothers and, 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 the, and Romulus founded Rome and he was the triumphant brother. And when they introduced the Romulans on screen in battle of tele, in a uh, balance of terror, they had on the view screen, a map of the neutral zone and the Romulan Empire, and it showed, in addition to the planet Romulus, the planet Remus or Romii, mm-hmm. and I mm-hmm. think it was. But there's been this idea since Balance of Terror, all the way back in TNG in TOS season one, that there was a second Romulan homeworld of some mm-hmm. kind that corresponds to the Romulus and Remus legend, and they've never explored it on screen until now. Right. Right. Uh, and you, you mentioned that the politics are very strange because Remus is apparently independent from the Romulan Empire, but capped, but conquered by them. They're well, used it's, it's, as, it's a it's a it's a planet that's under the control of the Romulan Empire, right? Yeah, but uh, they but it's a race. It's a different race from the Romulans, right? But yet the, they're negotiating with the uh, with the uh, M- the Senate over control. It, it's very strange. Yeah, and, so this is where yeah. the plot hole comes in. So I yeah. like the fact that they're doing a callback all the way back to Balance of Terror to finally tell us about the Remans. I like right. that. But they've set it up in a stupid way because the Remans are basically dilithium mine slaves. Mm-hmm. And, and, and yet, soldiers. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and soldiers, and they fought in the Dominion War, and they talk about that. So apparently there is a proposal on the table that the Romulan military supports of let's make let's bring them in to some kind of greater alliance like we're going to give them equal rights or something like that. They're negotiating for some kind of more equal alliance than they presently have and then we'll be able to like dominate the federation. And so forth. And it turns out the basis of this more equal alliance is they've got a planet killer that right. they've built. Okay, fine. Building planet killers is not hard for a spacefaring civilization. Um, it's actually pretty easy. But the way the Star Trek universe has been set up, how did the Remans manage to do this in secret? There's a line about they built it at a secret base. How? Yeah. You're a bunch of dilithium slaves. Where did you get the technology? Who are all that dwarfs other Romulan and Federation technology? Where are all your genius scientists? You don't have some big civilization you're running. You're a bunch of dilithium slaves. Right. Yeah, that is the that that bugs me. You know, that's just the we kind of just wave our hand at the whole oh, and by the way, they're these Remans and they have the ship, and we just kind of supposed to move on from that. I just like Yeah. Eh. And that's that's not how societies evolve. If you have a if you have so the Remans have advanced tech that's even better than what the Romulans have. Okay, then they would have naturally developed a more equal relationship over time as that technology developed. Yeah. They're not going to keep it secret and spring it on the Romulans a hundred years after they've got it. As they're technologically developing, they're going to be asking for more 
from the Senate saying, okay, we want some more rights. We want some more acknowledgement. We want some more privileges, whatever. As their technology develops, they're not going to have this massive, sudden technological leap and then demand equality at that point. Mm. So uh, another element in the story, apart from the main uh, story, is the, the, the Riker-Troy wedding. Um, they get, they're getting married in Alaska as, as the episode begins in the human wedding, and then they're heading to Beta Z for the naked Beta Zoid wedding. Um, that, the naked part was established in DS9, I think it was. Yeah, in, uh, uh, in, the, mm-hmm. initial, uh, in the initial Troy wedding episode with the oh, Armin, Armin Shimmerman annoying talking box. Right, the, T, mm-hmm. the TNG one, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and you know, that's a source of a lot of humor, of course. Um, Picard in this, in, the, in his toast calls Riker and Troy, his family, which is you know, g- given that his yeah. and, and, family is dead. And like many writers, Picard doesn't know what the meaning of fulsome praise is because he is, he, he says, I know it's expected of me to give fulsome praise at an event like this. Um, fulsome praise means excessive, insincere praise. <laughs> mm. So, yeah. Which uh, actually fits probably for a lot of <laughs> best man <laughs> speeches, actually. So it probably actually, yeah. they did know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this is where we get data singing blue skies for the first mm-hmm. time, which will show up again in card season one. Um, uh, one thing that, so they're on their way to beta Z, beta Z which apparently Swings them way out by Romulus, and the, the Star Trek cartography is all fluid messed up at best because yeah. it's also apparently right near the Cardassian borders <laughs> and because it's in the beta quadrant. Yeah, yeah it, it's all over the place. Anyway, they somehow can detect a signature from a positronic brain from a star system away. You know, they're outside a star system flying by at warp, whatever, and they detect a faint positronic signal. A set of them. Because yeah. his B4's body's in six pieces, and they're all emitting positronic signals. So Data's like an octopus. He's got a brain in each limb. <laughs> it's just, yeah. it's, so, it's, it's so dumb, it's hard to believe. You know, I mean, just like, come on. Like, Star Trek, again, Star Trek sensors are usually work at the, at the level of plot, you know, that, that's whatever's required. But it just, it's so frustrating to write it better. Just like, you know, figure out a better way to have this, you know, have some traitor show up and say hey i want to sell you some information about uh an android you might might be mm-hmm. interested in i mean something more plausible than this i mean it just it bugs me well the, the whole point of that that scene of finding b4 so that they can show the crew driving around in a modified side by side the buddy tv side by side i mean that's literally all it was it was an off the shelf side by side they put some bracing around it they put some plastic on it and they threw it out of the back of a shuttlecraft yeah yeah this is an action this is a first act uh set piece and yeah. the only ex- the only reason I mean we need to get B four into the plot mm-hmm. because he's our rescue plan he's our Doctor McCoy in this remake of Wrath of Khan he's yeah. the one that's going to carry the Katra so I understand they need to get B four into the story but the way they do it is to okay here's our here's here's a predictable action set piece for the first act of the movie where our hero Captain Picard implausibly goes on an away mission to collect these pieces just so he can ride around in a Jeep and in an action sequence. And we can have stunts like leaping, driving the Jeep off of a cliff and landing it in the shuttlecraft, you know, and yeah. Worf can shoot a big gun and things like, and it, I was never impressed by this, even when it came out in the theaters, just, it's, it's just meaningless action. I was just jealous because I want to do it. I want to go <laughs> okay. do, dune buggy, and I want to go dune buggy around and on a you know a side by side like that because that looked like fun. But <laughs> a violation of the prime directive for one thing. I mean, these are a yeah. pre-industrial, pre-warp civilization. You know, mm-hmm. the, they they did say they weren't anywhere close to the spot, but yeah, right. So yeah, yeah. and well, and this is all also an excuse to get before from Shinzon's point of view. He's infiltrating before into this group so he can use before as a Manchurian candidate on them. Right. And and Picard senses, he says, this doesn't feel right when they're on the planet. And then they just drop that. Yeah. Well, and why assume that a positronic signal must be another Sung android? Like, why? Well, they've yeah. kind of established that that's the only thing that has a pos- positronic brain. Like, but what s- they've, what they've somebody done. Somebody else can develop it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. yeah but yeah. it could be someone else had, it wasn't in this case, but it could be someone else has developed the same thing. However, on your point, Dom, that, 
sensing from star systems away. It's like, okay, if that's the way positronic brains work and the way sensors work, you can never lose data. <laughs> right. You yeah. can find him wherever he goes from star systems away, which it's actually a- wrecks several prior plots where data was well, lost. Significantly that, I mean, would- makes the enterprise uh, security a lot worse, too, for one mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I mean, that's the equivalent of saying, Hey, I picked up this cell phone from like, you know, Alpha Centauri. Yeah, right. The, I know exactly where this cell phone is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's basically what it is. That's they, the best air tag ever. They, <laughs> yeah. they they could have retconned it by by explaining that data has shielding to keep this from happening with him. Yeah. But this prototype didn't. That's yep. true. Uh, so we get a nice uh, cameo from uh, uh, Admiral Janeway. We we get uh, mm-hmm. to sh- show up after now that Voyager is done. And, and yeah, returned. and yeah. she ranks Picard now. Awesome. Yeah, it's, and she's we see her for the only time. Uh, well, in live action with the uh, the the new style uniform. So that that was nice. We do see her in the new style in uh, Star Trek Prodigy. Um, so yeah. and she's there giving his orders. Apparently, they wanted Jerry Ryan to show up as Seven of Nine at the wedding. Mm-hmm. And she refused because why would why would Seven be at this wedding of people she has no she's never met you know yeah I mean we could create an idea of her having met them and that sort of thing but so, it, so instead we, we got stuck. stuck with Wesley <laughs> yeah. at least has a reason to be there well he does he does he at least knows them but it raises questions because he's appearing in a Starfleet uniform too specifically that of a lieutenant jun- lieutenant junior grade. And so it's like, but wait, he was off with that interdimensional traveler dude. And we know he stays with the interdimensional traveler mm-hmm. people from Picard season two. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So how did he get through Starfleet Academy to become a lieutenant? You know, when did all that happen? Mm-hmm. Well, and there was, there was a cut scene, I seem to recall. I forgot yeah. to look it up, but there was a cut scene that kind of explains it re- where he talks about it real briefly, but yeah. yeah. Also, allegedly in the cut scene, he, or at least, the way it was written, I don't know if they filmed this. He he did show up from the Traveler people naked because he thought it was going to be a Beta Z ceremony here, and Picard has to requisition him a uniform. <laughs> mm. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, so they 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 put B four together, and Data does this brain dump into him, um, which again, as as you mentioned, Jimmy, this was clearly setting up. You know, data being revived in yeah. which they kind of pay off in Picard season three, where mm-hmm. the data comes back and he's sort of an amalgam of data, lore, and before. Yeah, which is okay. I'm glad data's back, but um, but they made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> so first thing, you got a new robot. You don't download all your memories into it. No, that's just stupid. And it's a huge security risk because you don't know where this thing has been. And in Mm -hmm. fact, B4 is a Manchurian candidate. Right. He is collecting information. You just gave him everything Data (laughs) knows. Yeah. Yeah. That was ridiculous. But then, so they would have used B4 as, you know, Data's personality would have taken over and so forth in Star Trek Eleven, which we didn't get. Um, And that would have been fine. But then... They and the whole reason apparently that data dies in this is because Brent Spiner felt he had aged out of the part and androids are supposed to be immortal. Mm-hmm. Hogwash. Mm. You already showed us in All Good Things, the TNG series finale, data with gray hair. Right. You know, that he it, chose admittedly, but yes. Uh, okay, fine. Yeah. So data has chosen here to 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 age visibly. So he fits in with his crew members. Which is what they you know? end up doing in Picard season three. Yeah. Yeah. And they should have just done that. So, But even given they're going to kill Data here for stupid reasons, and they didn't get to do Star Trek Eleven, they then just killed him again in Star Trek Picard season one, only to bring him back in season three. And it was a huge waste. They, just, they never right. should have killed Data in season one of Picard. They should have implemented the solution they finally did in season three. 
Yeah, they made a big deal in season one of Picard also about B4 being disassembled, mm -hmm. you know, that he just didn't work out. Like they kind right. of build up this whole expectation at the, by the, at the end of this movie that B4 is future yeah. data well, return. They, just, they want to answer why he wasn't involved, why he wasn't, yeah. why B4 wasn't running around with data's memories in season right. one. So that's why they did that. Yeah. And they didn't need to, they could have just, even they could have had the transition happen off screen and, uh, and, and, you know, Picard, they could have B4 walking around as data at the beginning of season Picard. Mm -hmm. And all they need is a line about, so how are you doing? Are you feeling more like it's been a while since I've seen you? Are you feeling more like B4, or more like data today? As well, the data memories are such a big part of me that that's effectively who I feel like. Right. And then have him, you know, go off and do something else for a while. Yeah. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just. I feel like, like you said, Jimmy, they, this was all built up with an expectation they were going to do with Star Trek XI, the return of Data, and it, and it didn't happen, and so they just decided to throw make it away. Make it worse. Yeah, yeah. make it worse. Um, so that we get when we get the meeting with Shinzon, I, I was wondering, as I was watching this again, because I, I haven't watched this in years, um, does, does Picard recognize Shinzon as himself when they first meet? Now, Clearly, the, the lights are low. It's dark. Uh, a trope which they get rid of quickly, that the, the need mm -hmm. for the darkness. Uh, you know, they, they, that's that one scene. And then from the rest of it, it doesn't matter how bright or dark it is. The, the Remans and Shinzon are fine. Well, they, um, they, make it, they, they make the ship look like it's dark. They make you know, Shinzon's ship look like it. You know, it's all dark colors and everything. But then they, yeah. they, they, they lighten it up more than it would have been if it was completely dark. I mean, it's not right. all shadows, but. They they imply that it's darker in there than it really is. I guess, yeah. But uh, so he doesn't recognize Shinzon, and although I guess he does, and when the when he when he puts the lights up, he sees him yeah. and says, "Oh, that looks a lot like I did when I was younger." Yeah. Um. I could I could see, like I don't I don't think of myself like uh, I can, I don't visual if I saw if I was in Picard's shoes, I'm not sure I would recognize this other person as a younger myself. Hmm. But I, I don't know. Uh, At a minimum, can, like you said, look, and, and of course they answer it's well. Why does you know? Of course, why doesn't he look like who we saw in Tapestry as well? Because you know he was beaten up and you know bones broken and stuff like that. Picard does show a picture to Crusher of him younger as Tom Hardy dressed in the younger yeah. you know in the cadet uniform, and he's already ridiculously bald at age. 25 or whatever that is <laughs> which is inconsistent with what we see in tapestry he did have mm -hmm. hair as the young picard in tapestry yeah although the young patrick stewart i i think he didn't have hair by that age he he lost it early mm -hmm. yeah um so and and you you kind of alluded to this jimmy the the common clone story trope of my life is meaningless while you're still alive if a copy of me is running around it's like uh, how do twins feel about that <laughs> I, just think, I think it's kind <laughs> well, of a dumb trope that that they they lean on yeah well when you've got a clone that was actually designed to replace the original yeah it's like well if your life's meaningless that's fine you know you're not supposed to be here in the first place so yeah this is yeah so identical twins their nature's clones yes <laughs> so one of the things that they don't really discuss in this but i think is I think intersects in an interesting way with Shinzon's daddy issues is what's wrong with cloning. Um, you know, it, it, people will know from a Christian and a spe specifically from a Catholic moral point of view, human cloning is just wrong. And a number of years ago, I said, why? Now, I don't doubt that it's wrong, but I wanted an explanation of why. And an explanation that goes beyond just it's it interferes with, you know, the way God designed human reproduction to work. That's true, and it is wrong for that reason. But is there another reason? How would I present it to a secularist who didn't believe that God had designed how human reproduction is supposed to work? And what I settled on is there is a reason, and it's the egotism of the person doing the cloning you are when you have a baby the normal way you it's a partnership you and your spouse who are in love don't know what of you and what of your spouse is going to be in mm -hmm. the child and you, that that's humbling you don't know you're taking a risk but you love each other and you're trusting and and so you're not controlling 
every little thing about your child. But in cloning, you are controlling every little thing about your child, and you're making it all me. Mm. Mm. That's the complete domination of one person over another on the genetic level. And it is, and I would say that is immoral Mm. for one person to completely dominate another person on the genetic level because I need another me so bad. That's (laughs) hideous egoism. Yes. And and so that reveals the moral defect in a way that even a secular person can understand it, who, someone who doesn't right. believe in God. And so even though I don't think the writers had any clue about how to articulate it, I think that that actually, Shinzon's reacting in a legitimate way mm. for a clone. Mm. If someone had determined every little thing about you to make you a genetic this other person, that would be cause for resentment. Mm. And, and who that am would, I? Yeah. And who am I? It's like, I, I'm meant to be an echo of you. As long as you're around, I, it, it's, it implies less worth to me okay. because I'm just a copy of you. Mm. And so I can understand Shinzon's daddy issues, even though, I don't think the writers know how to articulate them fully. Mm. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd argue too that that's some of the same problems with like uh, in vitro fertilization, where mm-hmm. a woman's uh, eggs are are mated with a sperm donor that she picks because of you know whatever traits you know she's Sheldon, going through the list. Sheldon Cooper, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know what, right. whatever traits are are out there that she wants. You know, I want someone who's six two and blonde hair and blue eyes, and okay, here we go. Or I want someone who's really athletic. Here we go. You know, and it's again same argument. It's like I'm going to design my kid for the traits that. I want the kid to have. Yeah. Or if you just merely marry someone merely for their traits, so their wealth, their pre- their in- intellect and not for love, um I mean even even on a, you know and then having kids naturally, that would yeah. still be wrong. I don't think you, I don't think you got to marry for love. You can you can marry for traits. Say this is a good match, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you're really doing a marriage there. Mm-hmm. And you're not just selecting a sperm sample. Yep. Sure. Exactly. And yeah. And so there's a moral difference there. And then when you, if, even if you have married someone because of their traits and the advantages that that will bring to the offspring, you're still not in control of the offspring process. Right, mm-hmm. right. No, that's true. You can have a very one different thing, child than you uh, imagine. One thing I did like, though, with this whole, this whole conversation of the clone versus the original was a line from, from uh, Shinzon where he talks about being the echo over the voice. Mm-hmm. You know, he's the echo to Card being the voice. And of course, the voice as in Lakutus. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, no, that, and I, I don't know if that was an intentional play or I, I bet it was. I mean, yeah, I, I could see them definitely kind of calling back to that. You know, you know, that Picard was the voice of the Borg. Well, now this is the echo of that voice. Yeah. They didn't bring up like they, they pretty much resolved Picard's Borg uh, angst and, you know, the, the, the PTSD from that experience in the prior. The, First the contact. Yeah. Yep. Well, they did, well, yeah, first contact, that's right. Um but they could have brought it up here and Shinzon could have brought that to him. It would have been an interesting aspect of see what you could have been. You we saw that in Locutus. You know, that could have mm-hmm. been an element of that and it would have been an interesting part of that that internal conflict for Picard. So, uh, a, a couple of things I want to note, just um the Remans apparently shoot as well as stormtroopers. Uh, they, <laughs> yeah. They, they well, there's these were, great warriors, the great warriors that couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, and 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 Picard beams over to their ship to take on a whole ship of Remans by himself to get yes. shins on. That's just suicidally stupid. Yeah. Yep. I did like Data subbing in for B4 uh mm-hmm. as That the, was good. The source yep. of the unauthorized leak and that sort of thing. They so the the way that gets set up for the listeners is they have reason to think that somehow Shinzon is getting data and they're not sure how. And Picard says, "Investigate information." In, yeah, oh, yeah, getting information. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and later, Data is talking to Jordy or someone and says, "We found what the source of the information is, and we think we can turn it against them." And then we don't hear anything more about that. And then we see. 
we we have seen B4 collecting the information. So we mm-hmm. know that data knows it's B4. But then we don't see anything more about that for a while until Shinzon beams apparently B4 over to his ship to collect more information from him. And it's eventually revealed that's not B4, that's data. Mm-hmm. They, had, they had put a transponder inside of B4, and they apparently transferred that transponder to data so he would get beamed out instead. Yeah, that leads to a, a funny scene where they're walking down the, the uh, corridor and Data's returning to be before, move, puny human animal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, a bit less florid, Data. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Um, I like well, they also, they also do the, uh, you know, where before, you know, Data's there as before and he gets information, you know, go somewhere, where? You know, he does the where. <laughs> out where? of my sight. Yeah. Out, out of my sight. Yeah. <laughs> You going to say, Jimmy? Yeah, I like the bit where, um, and I do like that because Bef- Brent Spiner's delivery is so childlike. Shinzon is like, you may leave. And <laughs> Data is like, where? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Out of my sight. <laughs> but I like this. There's a scene later where after this ruse and Picard and, and, and Data have gotten back to the Enterprise after a ridiculous tiny ship let's fly a tiny Romulan or tiny Riemann ship through the Riemann corridors and bust out through a window thing. Mm-hmm. It's like something mm-hmm. on star, star Wars. They get back and, and data reactivates the head of B4 yep. and B4 immediately realizes I can't move. And he says, I know I can't, I've only reactivated your cognitive and speech routines because you're a risk. And he starts interrogating him. Do you, do, what do you know about Shinzon? Do you know anything else about his plan? Do you know any, any of the capabilities of his ship? And B4 doesn't know any of that. Mm-hmm. And so Data is, has, is, has to shut him down and says, I'm going to deactivate you. And, um, and B4 says, for how long? And he says, indefinitely. And B4 is like, is indefinitely a lot? And he deactivates. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And data is like indefinitely he is a really long time. Yeah, he's mm. you know, how long is how long is that is what he asks. And yeah. 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 A long time. Uh so a couple of th- I, I a couple little plot holes, a couple little uh, uh uh logical holes in the in the, the story. During the battle, after they've crashed into the scimitar and they're the ships are locked together, mm-hmm. they put the scimitar in full reverse, which tears the scimitar away from the Enterprise. How? Because uh, yeah, Newton, no. Newton objects. There's, let's there's, just say there's yeah. n- there's no <laughs> friction holding the Enterprise in place. If once you've <laughs> ran, and it's I love the ramming sequence. Yeah, this is I great. We've never yeah. seen this in Star Trek before. But they ram the Enterprise into the scimitar, which is Shinzon's ship, and there's massive destruction. And then they reverse the scimitar well in real life unless you've got some kind of gravitational anchor you've put down <laughs> that's 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 it's just going to as it goes backwards it's going to carry the enterprise with it yep exactly <laughs> it, yeah th- that, that there might problem. eventually be a release of the ships but we're talking over you know yeah thousands of miles of space yeah. we're not talking right. about like you know two inches i i would assume that i can head it as they have some kind of gravitational anchor that, yeah. they're, that they're using. Um, and what that lets us do is see the scimitar do even more damage to yes. the Enterprise as it's pulling the two ships apart. Yeah, that was pretty good. And I like that. They smashed open the bridge, you know, yep. so the view screen was open to space and at least one person got sucked out of it and died. Yep. Um, and if fittingly, it was one of the, well, if fittingly, it was one of the people at the front of the bridge. Mm-hmm. Because right. all the air pressure from be- all the air behind the bridge would force the front people out. Which, yes. which by the way, da- Data's jump from the Enterprise actually showed that right as well. Because he started running and then Jordy used all the air that was in that corridor to push mm-hmm. him out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, also, by the way, Picard should have, knowing about the prototype transporter, because Data had showed it to him earlier in the movie, should have taken it with him. It would have saved everybody. <laughs> yes, yeah. it would have saved everybody. Would it had to have data bring it to him? Yeah. One 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 complaint, and this is this is a tactics on the part of Shinzon. You've got a a bay, a shuttle bay full of small fighters. 
why exactly are those fighters not manned and swarming the Enterprise? Exactly. Right. That's kind of what they're designed for, at least it looks like. Yeah. That's, that, what that's my biggest are for. complaint about the fight <laughs> of that fight scene is you know in, in a real situation like that, yes, you would have the two big ships going at it, but then you have those fighters see, fighters coming in and stinging mm-hmm. yep. the other ship. Also, while we're talking about bad battle tactics, um, so data, I was kind of stunned. At once we get into serious combat on the Riemann ship, I mean, before the space battle, Data is running at Brent Spiner speed. Mm-hmm. And I'm going, no, this guy's a robot. He's super strong. He is not limited by human speeds. He ought to be faster than Jackie Chan. Which we've seen uh, before. Yeah. 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 Um, and also then when for no clear reason, I mean, well, at one point, Sh- Shinzon's nameless viceroy and a bunch of remans beam over to the enterprise and there is an on-screen reason for that i forget what it is they may, it may have been go get picard for me so yeah. i can be a vampire yep. it was but they beam into the wrong level of the ship and the then, bottom <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and and then then Riker and Worf take a security team to go deal with them and in my notes it's like why on Star Trek do the high-ranking officers always stand in front of their security guards? <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. Because Riker and Worf are like in the lead of this party, and they're blocking the fire of the, of the guards behind them who are there to deal with the Remans. And yet, the guards behind them and not the high-ranking officers end up being shot. It's like the the it's like our main characters up in front are intangible, and the <laughs> the enemy shoots right through them and kills the guards behind them. I remember back in the day, day thinking to myself, they're on the bottom of this. They're in level twenty nine of the secondary hull, and they go into uh, v- Riker chases a viceroy into a Jeffrey's tube that goes down, down, and yep. then they fight for a while and end up over a big empty space in the ship like would they take an elevator like to the top like where how does where, where's he falling to it's just very weird yeah. it is very well weird. it's just where they wanted the star wars scene where yeah. you know it gets pushed yeah. off of the ledge yeah it's it's very inspired by the end uh by what happens to the emperor in empire strikes back yes as yep. god is my witness i thought emperors could fly um <laughs> <laughs> so uh if auto destruct is offline couldn't jordy just Go to the warp make, engines and destabilize them. Make them go critical. Yep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Uh, also, how exactly does Jordy know? Ad- admittedly, though, yeah, there would un- if you're really playing with antimatter and your ship is made out of matter, there are going to be serious safeguards in place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't just walk up to a nuclear reactor today and push one button and have it go critical and become a bomb. Right. And so, in this, I mean, they're des- that's designed not to happen. Yeah. And so it, it, I, 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 I think that there could be a dialogue fix for this. Picard could say, Jordy, can you go to the engines and destabilize them manually? And Jordy could say, there's all kinds of safety procedures. That's going to take me 20 minutes. Right. Mm. That's all they had to say. Yeah, that's true. Uh, speaking of which, Jordy, um, who has just encountered this, th- this theoretical th- Thaleron radiation weapon, knows exactly how it operates and how long it will take to get ready. Mm-hmm. we yeah. have eight minutes yeah it's completely completely theoretical they d- doesn't exist it's they don't even know if the particles really exist but it's theoretical i know everything about it yes we know exactly how long we have for picard to get over there and break and, it and by the way they, this wasn't a, a melting scene it was they they turn into stone and then break as they hit the ground they oh melt. yeah but they kind of melt first i mean they but, do i mean they bit. it their skin turns Bubbles into stone and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, besides, you can't pass up a good Raiders reference. No, you can't. Um, exactly. <laughs> in, 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 I'd be a little more merciful on the we've got seven minutes thing because they jo- Jordy knows how the weapon works. I mean, the Thaleron particles have been theoretical up to now. But he's he's got a diagram of how this sh- – it's got these fins that mm-hmm. need need to extend mm-hmm. and, and – um, and then it's going to route the radiation through those fins and then focus them on a target just like a death star and and so what i assume he's calculating is how long until those fins are extended to attack position mm. he can see how fast they're moving and could and and it's like okay they they'll be ready to fire this thing in 7 minutes or whatever 
Not, yeah. not the best weapon, I guess, if it and, takes and, forever to deploy. <laughs> yeah. And overly complex where it opens up and then panels open up and this slides out and that stretches out and that spin. I mean, one, one piece breaks and you're just, you're done. Your weapon's not going to work. So at the end, after Chin's on his den, Picard just stands there I as know. the countdown is going. And I'm like, why are you just standing there? Wasn't the whole point of you going over here and risking your life to stop this? Or is he just waiting for Data to show up and die I, in his yeah. place? I, I, so the way he kills Shinzon is kind of ridiculous. I mean, he's already killed most of Shinzon's bridge crew by himself. And then he he's up against this wall. And Shinzon approaches him with a knife. So Shinzon, and at this point, Picard has lost his phaser. So he doesn't have any weapons. So Shinzon is bringing a knife to a knife fight with an unarmed opponent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what Picard does is there are these bars on the wall, and he, which I assume are made out of metal. Mm-hmm. And he reaches up and grabs one of these bars and snaps it and bends it down so that when Shinzon approaches him with the knife, he impales Shinzon on the ragged edge of the bar. I have no idea. I mean, I could buy data doing that, (laughs) but I don't know how Picard is strong enough to do Mm. that. But even given that, he's not expecting Shinzon to do what he does next. Now, at this point, Shinzon is visibly decaying from his Mm. accelerated clone disease problem. And he's like, I'm glad we're here at the end together. Our destiny is complete. And then he pulls himself forward on the bar that's impaling him and grabs Picard by the neck like he's going to strangle him. And I would assume that what they're... And then after he dies, Picard just stands there while the countdown is going. And it's like, dude, Hmm. go over and shut off the countdown. That's (laughs) what you're here for. But I assume, and, and of course on the... On the non-diegetic level, the reason that that he's not doing that is so Data can do it and have yep. a self-sacrifice. Mm-hmm. But trying to make sense of it on the diegetic level, I assume what they would want us to infer is that killing your your evil twin clone son thing in this way, it's like it's you and you're face to face with your evil dying self, is so shocking to Picard psychologically that he's temporarily immobilized. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not buying it, but <laughs> yeah, me either. Stay on the, stay on the mission. Yes. I mean, yeah, it's dramatic and gross when your evil twin self pulls himself forward on the <laughs> instrument. You just impaled him with and <laughs> yeah. tries to strangle you and is talking to you in this lovey dovey way. But yeah, that's shocking, but stay on mission, dude. I have seen yeah. that in other, other action movies, by the way, that's not, oh, yeah. not original. Uh, so after Data's death, they have um, they have a, they gather in the uh, the conference room on the Enterprise to have a toast to absent friends, uh, which is the same toast that Kirk mm-hmm. gives in Search for Spock for yep. Spock, and uh, it's but, a traditional naval toast, right? Yep. Uh, Navy, Navy navies have toasts that are tradition on different days, all kind of re- old old traditions, and it's a traditional naval toast for well, Sunday. And that's they had the one at at the beginning too, where it's you know for clear sailing and. Yes. For uh, right. Riker when he's taking over the Titan. Right. And that's where we, Riker's going at the end of this is uh, off to the Titan, uh, where we will hear about that in Picard uh, season three. And Lower Decks. And Lower oh, Decks that's right. Yes. In Lower Decks. That's that. Yeah. That, that's we see him on the original Titan in, in Lower Decks. That's right. Uh, so any other thoughts about this one, Father Corey? No, I think we pretty well covered this one, <laughs> yeah, for better yeah. or worse. For better or worse. How about you, Jimmy? Any other notes? I like the plastic c- clear g- green symbols at the wedding on the drum set. Those yes. would be oh, yeah. t- totally impractical in, in the real world, so I assume there's some fancy high-tech material symbols. I mean, they're really yeah. just transparent green plastic and yep. wouldn't mm-hmm. be good symbols at all, but they look cool and yeah, futuristic. I wonder if Zildjian is working on those today. <laughs> the famed symbol makers yep. who are oh, yes. about 20 miles from me. Uh, oh, uh, oh, nice. Busy. Yeah. They're really a local place. Speaking of material science, mm-hmm. um, in the ridiculous first act set piece where they're running around on the Jeep. Yeah. Um, Picard and Worf have safety glasses on. Eh, okay. I can buy that. You don't want dust and rocks and stuff hitting your eyes. Data is wearing safety glasses. <laughs> yeah. 
What does Data need safety glasses for? His right. eyes, I assume, are rock hard. Right, yeah. right. Because Brent have... Spiner needs them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I laugh actually when when the 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 ATV comes launching out of the shuttle the first time. You can see that wharf is actually just a dummy stuck in the back seat. Yeah, yeah. Because it like <laughs> just <laughs> wobbles around as it bounces. Yeah, the w- <laughs> wharf weebles wobble. Uh, all right, so that's it for our discussion of uh, Star Trek Nemesis, and it brings to the end our discussion of all of the classic era movies. We will be uh, in the future talking about the Kelvin era ones. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> There's only three of them. Uh, but we do have feedback on our recent uh, episode 300, where we discussed be- the best Trek episodes ever. And uh, we've, we've got so much feedback, we're going to split it over a couple of the next two episodes. But we'll get have a, a bit here. Our first one comes from Eric, who sent in this email. Uh, so I have some favorites you didn't mention. My favorite Star Trek movie is Galaxy Quest, which, you know, yep. we've, we've talked about that yep. as the best Star Trek movie. Uh, yep. Uh, his uh, favorite DS9 is The Visitor, which has Tony Todd as old Jake Sisko, the writer. This is the time travel episode where... Jake is in an alternate timeline where his father died and he's become a writer and is going to fix his timeline by yep. killing himself. <laughs> right. Uh, then we have the uh, an Enterprise, Doctor's Orders, which Eric loves because this, of my job as a surgeon partner. Uh, for TNG, he likes 11, uh, 11001001, the, the binar episode. Mm-hmm. I liked it because of Riker's tryst with Minuet, and we see her again in a later episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, And then for Discovery, really? This show sucks. (laughs) And then he says, this is a great episode that highlights the crap that this show is. Uh, And I love all the SQPN podcasts. Uh, Thank you, Eric. Uh, Excellent. So Flying Car 100 on YouTube offers uh, their list. uh, TOS, Mirror Mirror. For Film, The Voyage Home. TNG, The Royale, which is an interesting uh, choice. Mm -hmm. DS9, Move Along Home, which is an even more interesting choice. (laughs) <laughs> that's 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 an offbeat one and lower decks crisis point uh then uh, jttr zoss on youtube writes uh he on our continuing discussion of brian keith's untimely end uh mm-hmm. brian keith killed himself three weeks after his daughter committed suicide which is mm-hmm. tragic and it is tragic uh, sheds mm-hmm. some more interesting light on that um, Mark Gillies on YouTube writes, haven't made it all the way through the episode, but a few comments on the selection so far. I've never seen masks somehow with the peculiarities of syndication in the nineties. I missed it. Didn't even know it existed until I bought the next gen companion over the years. It doesn't air that often and it. I didn't pay for the DVDs. Now I do have the chance to see it, but since it's a lost episode for me, I can't bring myself to watch it like the old guy in that doctor who episode hoarding it away. I was shocked when Dom said controversial choice and then said inner light until today. I've never uh, heard anyone talk bad about that episode. I've always loved it. Patrick Stewart was great in it. I couldn't, I could watch it any day of the wretched next gen movies. My friend always listed as one of their favorites too. Great episode so far. Can't wait to hear the rest. And then Kelly on YouTube says, uh, I agree with most of the panel on their favorite episodes. I'm glad that Jimmy mentioned duet from DS nine. I don't think it gets nearly the amount of love that it deserves. I know that it was it was in the first season, and the first season of DS9 was rough at times. However, this one was incredible. I loved both of the performances of Harris Eulin and Nana Visitor. The discussion about the inner light from TNG was interesting. For years, it was one of my favorite episodes. However, I recently rewatched it, and I agree with Jimmy that it's not as good during a rewatch. There are many episodes of all the Trek series that I can re- I can watch multiple times and still enjoy them very much. This is not one of them. It's good, but not fantastic. I'm glad that Jimmy is going through 12 Monkeys. It's a favorite of mine, and the reason why I was thrilled when Terry Metalis took over Picard. It's also the reason why I mentally refer to Shaw as Captain Deacon. Yeah, that's because mm. the character that um, uh, that he plays, that the Captain Shaw actor plays on 12 Monkeys is named Deacon. Yep. And he's he's basically, I think I may have mentioned, he's basically kind of a road road warrior like chieftain of a of a gang that gradually becomes a good guy. And he's got the same Captain Shaw kind of dark, humorous, able to speak unpleasant truths to people thing going. And <laughs> nice. I I totally understand why Terry Metalis included him in Picard. He was he was good as Deacon and he was great as Captain Shaw. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to watch 12 monkeys. So yeah, 
Uh, yeah. we'll, we, <laughs> so we talked about that before. Uh, Sandy sent in an email sending, uh, saying, finding out which episodes you consider the best was great fun. I mostly agree with all of you, but was surprised that none of you picked the DS9 episode, The Visitor. It's always mm. been a favorite of mine. And you're right. I, I would. I it's another great one. I yeah, agree with that as well. Yeah. Uh, Sandy says, I hope you decide to do a worst po- episode podcast also. Uh, can you say Aquiel? Thanks for doing the Secrets of Star Trek podcast. It's very enjoyable. I did write back to Sandy. We did do a worst episode. That was our two hunters episode. And you can find that at starquest.fm slash SST 200. So, yeah, I, I understand. I know uh, Aquiel is generally regarded as one of the worst. I'm not as I'm not as down on it. I, I recognize mm-hmm. it's far from perfect. But I actually kind of like aspects of it. Mm. I don't remember. Uh, it's yeah. another Jordy. Jordy has a failed girlfriend episode. Oh. <laughs> That's probably why. <laughs> then uh, Wesley sent in an email. Not that Wesley. I continue to love and listen to your podcast. I even have my son listening to it in the car as I take him to baseball and basketball practice. Hey, Wesley, son. <laughs> so we recently listened to your latest episode about your favorite Star Treks. I just wanted to share a few of mine. Uh, and then he gives a long list. Uh, he says in TOS, it's so hard to narrow down because there's so many good ones. Uh, then he gives a list of long list of, from each of the series. So I, I I'm not going to get into it here uh, just because we're going so long, but um, it's as he says, so those are my picks. I won't bother with the other series. I don't watch them nearly as much. Keep up the good work. I love the podcast. And and thank you, Wesley, for sending the list. We we yes. did uh, listen to them uh, earlier and enjoy the, your list. So uh, that's that uh, for feedback. And now we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including GR, Peter G, Daphne M, Amanda M, and Chris P, not Pine. <laughs> Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And we'd also like to thank Victor Lambs who edited this episode. So that's it from us. What did you think of Star Trek Nemesis? You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek. Our Facebook page at facebook.com slash starquestmedia. Send an email to trek at sqpn.com or visit our Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. You can watch us in the Secrets of Star Trek on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash starquestmedia. And we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the TNG episode, Angel One. Oh, boy. <laughs> Fun. Until then, Father Cory Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Thank you, Dom. And Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thank you, and Jolan True. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Star Trek on Star Quest. And remember, why does the tall man have a furry face? <laughs> because the show is better when he does. <laughs>